Our moderator today, as you know, this program is, is, is always moder moderated by an ambassador. Uh, we have uh, Her Excellency uh, Muni Figueres, and she is, uh, uh, has been ambassador here since uh, early September of 2010. Uh, for those of you that, uh, that don't know Costa Rica, it's an absolutely wonderful country. It has a, a, a very um, close relationship with the United States and has for, for many years. Um, we have uh, a uh, uh, very close trading relationship as well, and she served as Minister of Foreign Trade uh, in Costa Rica and has been working uh, in trade, economic, diplomatic uh, activities throughout her career uh, with a focus on, on, uh, on economic and trade issues. So with that, uh, Madam Ambassador, I'd like to turn it over to you, and we'd really like to obviously leave the time for Q&A so that our, uh, our, our guests can have the opportunity of uh, asking questions. And again, thank you all for being here and for doing this and taking the time out of your busy days. Thank you, Ambassador Holliday, Mr. Chairman, and fellow ambassadors and members of the Diplomatic Corps, and journalists from all over the world, and other people who are here. Thank you for coming. I look forward to a very interesting and stimulating exchange of comments um, between our two guests and, of course, coming from you as well. I think that uh, conventional wisdom has it that conventions um, define more clearly the position of candidates and of their parties. At least they help to delineate and to get down to specifics that haven't been made evident during the campaign prior to the convention. So one question I would just throw out to all of us as we start this process is, do we know any more than we did before the conventions about uh, the candidates and about the parties and about the prospects for winning the elections? Um, and another thing that I have on my mind and that I think might be useful for our guests to help us understand is the complexities of the American electoral and political system. I come from a country of four and a half million inhabitants, and life electorally and politically is much simpler. You just vote directly for your president. You have one platform that the party negotiates and the candidate sticks to. Um, you do not have different rules around the country for how you vote, where you vote, whether it's in a box with a piece of paper or um, uh, with a little mechanical tab. Everything is really quite homogeneous. Um, so I think life for the American electorate is much more complicated than for many of uh, our citizens in, in the countries represented in this room and we would really benefit from a little bit of education, even though it may be very brief, simply about the mechanics of the political system, if you all will refer to it at some point, aside from the remarks that you're going to make now. So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to be between these two powerhouses of politics. Um, and I would like to welcome, I think I'd like to go alphabetically if you will allow. Okay. So, Mr. Freed, would you like to begin? Certainly. Um, uh, I usually let my, far, uh, my, my boss, first of all, and my uh, superior to go first, but I would be uh, happy to start out. Um, thank you for inviting us this morning. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, I would say that, in my mind, the big question of this election is, was, uh, was the election of 2008 a um, a harbinger of things to come, or was it a historical anomaly? And I say that because what happened in 2008 was extraordinarily historic. We had elected Barack Obama, who uh, was a unique figure in history, uh, who ran as a, um, in a historic time uh, with an uh, extraordinarily unpopular president. Uh, he's re replacing an unpopular President President Bush. Uh, we had, um, uh, he, uh, he had headwinds at his, at his back. 
uh, in, in a way that you had the financial crisis that blew up, you had the McCain campaign that was a somewhat of a disaster, uh, and you had um, uh, so many different things going on, and it was a historic election for this reason. Uh, in 2008, Obama received 365 electoral votes to McCain's 173, it was a complete blowout. He got 10 million more votes. Uh, nine states in 2008 voted for a different party than in 2004. Obama was able to raise $760 million uh, in 2008 to McCain's $340 million. He had the press at his back. He had, uh, according to different accounts, he had 69% uh, favorable coverage to McCain's 43%. Um, he had uh, in increased participation with African American voters. It was from 11% uh, to 13%. He, he, he killed McCain with young voters. He killed McCain with um, women voters, and he basically was able to run the table. And then you had uh, what happened in 2010. In 2010, you had um, a historic defeat on the other hand. You had uh, the Democratic Party suffered massive defeats uh, at the state and uh, national level. Um, the Republicans in the House gained 63 seats, uh, which is, was the biggest turnaround uh, since the Depression. Uh, at the state and local level, you had um, uh, 680 seats won by the Republicans over the Democrats, which was an all-time record since the post-Watergate era. Uh, and so you have these two elections. You had 2008, which swung wildly for Obama, in which he had great uh, uh, wins at his back. You had 2010, which was a great reaction to President Obama. And now you have 2012, which is a great mystery to people. And if you look at all of the polls, uh, it's still very, very tight. And the question is, how is this going to vote? And if you look at, at the demographics of, of the electorate, it's very interesting. Because if you see uh, voters uh, over the age of 65 are overwhelmingly white voters, and they overwhelmingly um, are going to vote, uh, they overwhelmingly uh, voted for uh, the Republicans in, uh, in 2010. And they voted against President Obama in 2008. How are they going to vote uh, over 65? If you look at um, uh, the 35 to 49-year-old voters, the chances are uh, that demographic in America is 73% white. How, uh, if you look at, at the polling in that group, it's a very, very different uh, um, uh, view of how people are going to vote. The, the, the likelihood is that they're more likely to vote and they break much more for President Obama. Uh, if you look at voters under the age of, uh, from 18 to 34, the demographics are fascinating because they're 61 percent white and they're almost overwhelmingly going for uh, Obama. So this, is, this tells you about the demographics of the country and how the country is changing. It's becoming a much more diverse country uh, and that's why I asked the question, is this a, was the election of 2008 a historic anomaly, or was it a, a, a harbinger of things to come in a much more diverse country and a much more a, a country that's going to swing a little bit more towards towards the left? Um, you know, the president has a great opportunity, and he also has great peril with with these d different demographics. Um, and the fact of the matter is, he needs to do better with the white ethnic voters than he's doing right now, but. The fact of the matter is that President uh, Romney, or I'm sorry, uh, Governor Romney, is just not very popular uh, with these voters. And, and this is where the, the real distinction is going to come in. Now, talking a little bit about the conventions, you know, the conventions, uh, the, the, the conventional wisdom is that the conventions help clarify things for the Democrats in the sense that uh, uh, Jack's former boss, Bill Clinton, gave a wonderful speech. Uh, on behalf of, of Mr. Obama, President Obama, in a way that really helped uh, get the Bubba vote back for, for President Obama. Um, the, the Republican convention was, you know, just fine. I, I was down there in, in, in Tampa, uh, and I've been to, I don't know, eight or nine conventions, and uh, this was just right in the middle of them. It was not that great. It wasn't that bad. It was just kind of there, although it had some uh, interesting public speakers. Uh, Condi Rice was a gave probably the best speech of the Republican convention, uh, and then you had Clint Eastwood, uh, who gave a um, I thought it was brilliant, but other people hated it, uh, uh, and it was it certainly was odd. And then and, and then um, you had 
uh, Mitt Romney give a, you know, a Mitt Romney type speech. It was just kind of fine. But one of the things that Mitt Romney didn't mention during that speech was a huge blunder. He didn't mention the troops and he didn't mention Afghanistan. And all of a sudden, as we talk about what these, the topics are for this, for this election, you know, Mitt Romney wanted to keep the, the, the discussion completely on um, the economy. But guess what? As what we've seen this morning and, and, the, and the, uh, the very upsetting uh, elements in the, at the embassy, uh, you know, foreign policy continues to kind of buttress into this, this campaign. And uh, you know, the, obviously for, for Mitt Romney, he's got to uh, show himself to be a credible uh, alternative to President Obama. He's got to have credible uh, views of foreign policy because foreign policy is an extremely important part of economic policy. And uh, I think that for Romney, he hasn't established that credibility yet. Uh, and from my perspective, talking about the, the kind of myriad of state laws that, that occur at the, at the local level. I mean, America is based on a federalist system. So each state runs its own uh, election campaigns. Uh, they have their own rules, which means that what you'll end up having is uh, some states, like in Ohio and Pennsylvania, are trying to pass laws to make it uh, more difficult if you don't have your ID to vote. And you know the Republicans are saying that this is for a border fraud uh, reasons, and perhaps it is. But it also helps them electorally, as a, a Pennsylvania state legislature uh, legislator pointed out. So all these things, kind of uh, to your point of the complexity, it's a very complex election, but it's also a very much of a binary choice. And at the end of the day, the, the, the American people are going to decide, do they really want um, someone like uh, President uh, Obama to continue to run the country, or do they, they want um, uh, to give a chance to someone like Mitt Romney? And the, the biggest impact, I think, of this election is other, outside of uh, foreign policy, obviously, the, is going to be the economy. And if the jobs numbers don't improve, if we have two more uh, bad jobs reports, I think Mitt Romney is going to have a, a very decent chance of winning this election. So that's kind of a quick run through, and I'll let uh, my, my boss kind of give his view. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Frege. This Pardon me? Is it off or on? What do you, what do you normally do? Okay. I'm, I'm fine with it on the record. Are you, are you okay? I'm fine with it on the record. I'm fine with, I'm fine with that on the record. <laughs> well, with so many people from other countries here, I think the point taken by you, Mr. Frehe, about foreign policy having uh, unexpected interferences in the mm -hmm. what should be a domestic political process or what is normally accepted as one is a very interesting uh, observation to make, and I'm sure later on we'll talk more about that. Mr. Quinn. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, okay, okay, let me, I'm gonna jump around a little bit, forgive me for that, because I do want to react to some of the things I've heard. Um, the, the first and most important thing I, I, I want to start with is, as the ambassador said, it's different here than in Costa Rica, <laughs> all right? You will hear for the next six weeks that Obama's ahead or Romney's ahead in national polls. Those are pretty much meaningless because we elect people through a process that counts votes by states. That's critically important. President Bush was elected or reelected. He was elected having lost the overall popular vote. But he won more electoral votes. That is to say, he won more states than his opponent. Okay, so that's, that's really quite important and, and can come into play. And it will bear on some of the remarks I'm gonna make about where things stand now. Secondly, on the convention, um, was it informative? It, it did, I think, set the stage, um, first of all, for 2016, right? Um, 
because I think the Secretary of State, if she wants to be president, um, she will certainly be the Democratic nominee. And I say that, by the way, you should understand, I'm a Clinton Democrat. I'm not an Obama Democrat, I'm a Clinton Democrat. Um, and President Clinton gave a breathtakingly wonderful speech that really did energize um, Obama's base, interestingly, because they're very, very different bases. Um, but he managed to do that. Um, John talked about trends, um, 2008, 2010. Why did, um, why did the Democrats get wiped out in 2010? Um, I think part of it, um, a big part of it, was that in 2010, um, the President Obama stubbornly insisted on pushing through health care reform at a time when the things that Americans were thinking about involved jobs, mortgages, um, you know, the country was in an economic crisis. I think people were scratching their heads and wondering, wh why are we talking about healthcare reform at a time like this? Um, and I think that um, the president's freshness at that time, um, his newness, um, his lack of experience um, really came to the fore. Um, and I think they've learned lessons from that, as did, by the way, President Clinton after, in 1994, losing a, 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 an incredibly devastating um, election, at which point the House of Representatives went from Democrat to Republican. Um, OK, so um, what's going to happen? Let me, let me start with what's going to happen. There are any number of different possibilities. Romney could win. Romney could win, and the Republicans could take the House and the Senate. Obama could win, and the Democrats could take the House and the Senate, and then every permutation in between. I'll tell you what I really think will happen, um, and, and I'll try to explain why. I think Obama wins. It's going to be, it, it's, it, it, that is a very cautious prediction because it's tight. It is very tight. But I think he wins. Um, and I think the Democrats probably keep control of the Senate, but they lose seats. Um, they may even control it only because it's evenly divided 50 50, and the vice president is the tiebreaker. Um, they can't possibly, I don't think, um, take the House of Representatives. Okay, so I'll tell you why. Okay, um, in in terms of winning the presidency, again, it each state casts votes for president, and they cast their votes based on how the people in the state vote. So you need 270 electoral votes to win. Um, starting this campaign, most observers would say that Obama has in the bank 221 of those 270 electoral votes. Those states will not move. Romney has 191. Those states will not move. In fact, remarkably, um, right now, Tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent to change the minds of a few more people than are in this room. <laughs> okay? Because they will tip these swing states. Right? Nobody's worried about what's going to happen in Utah. No one's worried about what's going to happen in California or New York. 
It's all about a handful of states that will decide the election. Those states, by the way, are Colorado, Michigan, Nevada, New Hampshire, Wisconsin. We think, I think, those states are likely to go to Obama. But again, likely, not certain. Florida, Virginia, Ohio, Iowa, up in the air. No one can tell you right now how they'll go. North Carolina, likely to go to Romney. These, by the way, are states that Obama won last time. Now, the interesting thing, I think, I mean, just in terms of numbers, if Romney carries North Carolina and also carries the two close to call ones, Florida, Virginia, Ohio, Iowa, he will be the next president. Over. That will put him over the top, 270 votes. If Obama wins the ones that are presently leaning his way, Colorado, Michigan, Nevada, New Hampshire, and Wisconsin, if he wins those and wins any one of the Romney states, he'll be president. Okay? It's that close. Now, um, I, I really want to hasten to point out that it's, what, it's the 12th of September. We have a long way to go. We have debates in front of us. We have economic data that are going to be reported, including critically um, two jobs reports. We have a lot of spending in those states that will still occur on, on behalf of the candidates, if not by the candidates. We have turnout on election day that is critically important. And lastly, we have, we talked about what happened tragically in Benghazi. We have the possibility of an external influence that none of us in this room or anywhere else can predict that might affect the outcome. Um, all those things are out there. So anything you hear from John or me or anyone else about what might happen on November 6th could be upset very, very easily. Um, so let me, let me just talk quickly, um, because I, I really do think it's important that we have more um, back and forth with, with you. Um, if, if you watched, let me talk a little bit about the conventions, and wh why I think Obama's going to win. Um, if you watch the Democratic convention, oh my god, how many, how many of you watched any part of it? How many times did you hear, it's more important that you love your country than who you love? I mean, the, the appeal to the gay community was just, it's like, OK, I get it. You know, <laughs> we want every gay person in America to support the ticket. Um, the, the Democratic Convention was incredibly well tailored to appeal to the base constituencies that the party cares about. Gays, women. Did you hear much about choice? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, we do criticize Governor Romney for forgetting Afghanistan, and President Obama did not. Um, but boy, we did not forget to mention that we think a woman should be able to choose, OK? <laughs> Um, young people, you know, all of a sudden, um, it's like, oh yeah, student loans, student loans, student loans. That has not been a big issue in town, but boy, if you watch the Democratic Convention, student loans were a big issue. Why? Because we care about gay people. They're going to vote for Obama. We care about women. We really think they're going to vote for Obama. 
We care about young people. They're going to vote for Obama. Why? Because they all voted for him four years ago. Um, now, as the camera panned the audience, did you see a lot of African Americans? Yeah. There was a recent survey <laughs> that suggested that Romney had the support of 0% of African Americans. I think that's a little bit overstated, or I should say understated. But the point is, we are counting on African Americans to support President Obama. The keynote speaker, uh, Mayor Castro, who I thought was just fabulous, brilliant. I mean, just, he was like Obama was in um, 2004. I mean, it was just this like brilliant <laughs> delivery. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, he has an identical twin. Mm -hmm. So my wife tweeted that Castro's gonna be elected president and they're gonna have so much fun with the Secret Service because they're not gonna know which one is the real president. <laughs> Women, young people, gays, African Americans, Latinos, okay, and then the last category, independents. Obama won independence significantly four years ago. He's leading now among independents. But in all of those categories, I caution, while he's leading, he's not leading by the margins. He won those groups four years ago. That's troubling because he's probably losing more significantly among white men than he did four years ago. Um, white men are not happy with him. Um, so the bottom line in terms of the numbers, you get 10 or 11 swing states. Obama's ahead in eight or nine of them but he's ahead by this much. It is really narrow. He's ahead by a point or two. That could slip away, or it could firm up. Um, now, let's step back for a moment and just put this out there. It's breathtaking that he's ahead, okay? I don't, the last time a president was reelected with unemployment this high was in the 1930s, when President Roosevelt was reelected. You really have to scratch your head and say, what's going on? I mean, how can the Republican Party not be beating this guy? The answer, I think, is they don't have a very good ticket. Um, and, and it's really interesting to me because I would have said that of all the people who ran for the Republican nomination, it would be smart to pick the guy who's most able to move to the center who has a background of, of being a moderate, Romney. I was wrong. And, and this is my own personal explanation for that. I think the American people don't like it when you run a campaign standing for something that your history doesn't support. OK? To put it really bluntly, I think people don't trust this guy. Like, but you're not a Tea Party, radical, crazy Republican. And now you're saying these things. Secondly, and related to that, 
When I was a kid, there was a television show called I've Got a Secret. Okay. This guy's got secrets. It started out with the personal tax returns. I'm not going to show you my personal tax returns. I think the American people are like, OK, you've got something to hide. OK? You know, you're cheating, OK? Or you're doing a whole lot better than us, and we can't relate to you. Now, the big secret is what he's going to do about tax reform. He won't tell anybody. Well, he says, I've got principles. People are going to pay more if they make a lot of money. But I'm not going to tell you how. Okay. Thirdly, I think the choice of um, Congressman Ryan, which was on first impression a good idea, you mean, you know? Athletic, tough, serious guy. I think it was a bad choice, really bad choice. Because um, I don't think people trust him. I think people get the fact that he's lying about Medicare. And I think the Democrats will kill the Republicans on that issue. I think people understand that the criticism they're launching against President Obama on Medicare, that he's taking $716 billion out of Medicare to fund Obamacare, guess what? That's in Ryan's own budget. I can't leave this without mentioning. I've run a couple of marathons. OK? You, you don't run a marathon in over four hours and misremember it as under three hours. <laughs> OK? I think people get it. This guy's a fraud. All right? So I don't think he helps. Um, OK, I think it's best to leave a lot of this for, for back and forth. Um, again, my guess is that in terms of the Congress, we end up with a very narrowly divided Senate, which could go either way. Could be Democrat, could be Republican. Might be on the edge of the coin, OK? Could be 50-50. Um, and I think the House remains in Republican hands. There's a lot more to talk about, and I hope you have questions. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Well, these are very interesting um, viewpoints and perspectives that we've had now. I would add another element, because there's so many journalists in the room, which is the role that television is playing or is not playing. Given all the money that's being poured into it, uh, there are many, at least I've read articles that say that this, all of this money is because it is not moving the electorate and because people maybe are no longer influenced electorally in a determinate fashion by television the way they used to be, they now get their information, political information elsewhere. So I would just put that on the plate as well because well, we have so many people here who are in the profession. Let me just make two points. Um, number one, in those 10 or 11 swing states, you literally cannot buy a minute of television ad time between now and the election. It's all bought. It's all done. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of, I, I don't know about you folks, but um, I spent the month of August in Colorado, and it was so refreshing. Uh, to be out there and actually see political commercials instead of seeing Robert Wagner and Fred Thompson telling me why I need a reverse mortgage. <laughs> like, okay, we're talking about real issues right. now. You know? I do think that people at some point turn it off. You know, they, they get it. Um, I don't know, by the way, I was talking to somebody last night about the, um, if you live in this area and watch television, um, there's an ad running about um, a casino in Maryland. And I can't, for the life of me, 
figure out whether I'm for this or against this. Right. You know? It, it's the most mystifying political ad I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is just wasted money. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would make an observation, though, that um, and the reason I pointed out the, the, the money in 2008 is that Barack Obama had double the money of John McCain, right. and um, Barack Obama ran the most negative campaign in history. He ran more negative ads than any other president in history. Everyone thinks he was the hope and change guy, but he was actually the most negative, and he destroyed John McCain. Uh, he's not going to be able to destroy Mitt Romney with the same kind of onslaught, because the Romney campaign has more money than the Obama campaign. And more importantly, uh, the Romney uh, allies have more money than the uh, uh, Obama allies. Uh, uh, if you look at these, these rise of the super PACs, um, they have, uh, they've raised uh, a billion, almost a billion dollars, I mean, probably more than a billion dollars. And that is, um, that is an advantage that the president is not going to have this time around. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, you know, the reason that Coke and Pepsi advertise every day is because if they didn't uh, and the other one did, the yeah. people would, if Pepsi would just advertise and Coke wouldn't, then people would just drink Pepsi. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a, people like to say that uh, political advertising has no impact, but that's, that's not true. Mm -hmm. It obviously has an impact because that's why they're, these, they're pretty smart, seasoned professionals. And the other thing that's interesting uh, is uh, the newest development is the micro-targeting of both campaigns. And this is probably the Obama campaign slightly ahead of the, the Romney campaign on this, although George Bush was way ahead of John Kerry on micro-targeting. That is that the, the targeting the ads specifically to the, the 30 people who are undecided. Um, and um, that's why if you are undecided, you're going to be everybody's best friend for a long time not just with advertising. That's why you will see ads on every, every possible campaign, every possible cable channel. If you're watching Matlock uh, uh, or the History Channel or uh, MSNBC or wherever you're watching, you're going to get a campaign commercial. And uh, as Jack pointed out, you cannot uh, buy ad timing anywhere in these swing states because uh, it's all bought. And if you're a broadcaster, this is a great time to be a broadcaster. And, and, and the Wait, one thing I would add to that, it, it, it's, not just, it's not just the advertising. Have, have you noticed how frequently in the last few weeks President Obama's had a beer? <laughs> Seriously. He's been in places, and, and they even released the, um, the recipe for micro-brew beer in the, in the White House. Why is he doing that? And that's very deliberate. You know why? Because he can drink beer. Okay? He's like you and me. He watches sports and drinks beer. Wait till he starts eating pretzels in public. Okay? The other guy doesn't drink beer. He's not like you and me. Okay? He's right. just not like us. Well, this has been very stimulating. I'm sure there are many questions. Shall and, we start? Yeah. Would you like, Heather, Thank to you, choose Ambassador. the questions? Yes, I'll do just a few okay. quick ro uh, rules of the road. Um, I think we'll do about two to three questions in each round, just yes. to, because it's a little crowded space, so I can get to everyone. I think we'll start here with our ambassadors, if they right. have any questions. And also, if you, before you ask your question, could just give your name, affiliation, and especially for our journalists to let us know where you're from would be wonderful. Ambassador, I believe you. I'm Petr Kandalovic, the Czech ambassador. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, you didn't mention Pennsylvania. I just suspect that this is the 11th state, because you said 11 states, and uh, you um, listed 10. So that's my explanation. And then uh, you might want to comment on Pennsylvania a little bit. And secondly, um, I'm uh, very much interested on your thoughts exactly about these super PACs and about Citizens United. If you, if you may elaborate a little more on that, please. Sure. I, and I'll be really quick on this. I, I think if Obama loses Pennsylvania, he loses the presidency. I mean, it, it's, that's in his column. Um, and he, he, there's no way he can afford to lose that. Because if he loses that, he'll lose a lot of other of those swing states. 
Can we take more questions? Uh, I'll take a question. On, on super PACs, um, I could go on for a really long time, and you don't want me to do that. The Supreme Court of the United States, in my view, has ruined this country. Okay? Um, their campaign finance decisions um, have put the country up for auction. Um, the, the way we finance our politics in America is a cancer on our democracy. Uh, and it's all because of the Supreme Court. It's a horrible thing. I don't know what we're going to do about it. I hope that someday we can get to the point where we have public financing. But it is ruining this country. Uh, Claudia Fritsche, Ambassador of Liechtenstein. <coughs> Maybe for the benefit of our visitors from abroad, one of the speakers uh, might elaborate a little bit about voters' registration. It's a bit of a touchy subject, but it is uh, being read about, and maybe you'd like to make some comments on that. Thank you. Maybe you'd like to comment both PACs and... Yeah, I'll, 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 first of all, I'll, let me say a little bit about Pennsylvania. Um, it's going to be a lot closer than people think. Uh, it's, um, it's really kind of a... What James Carville said about Pennsylvania, it's uh, you got Pittsburgh and uh, Philadelphia with Alabama in the middle. Um, so it's a, it's a very, very, uh, mm -hmm. got some very, uh, Pittsburgh is very blue collar, uh, predominantly white. Uh, so if uh, Obama does not uh, cut into that vote total there, he can be in serious trouble. But I would say that it's a, the holy grail for Republicans. They always think they're going to get Pennsylvania, and they never do. Um, so the big question is, will they put money in there? Uh, and I don't know the answer. It's a big question, but I think they will put some money. Rendell, and Rendell, the former governor, is very nervous. Uh, on super PACs, let me say that um, I, I don't, you know, super PACs are super PACs. Supreme Court decided what it did. What's interesting about the, the rise of super PACs and what happened in 2008, in 2008, all the big money was going to pay for things like moveon.org and big, the, the precursor to super PACs. George Soros, a lot of uh, very wealthy uh, liberal philanthropists were pouring a lot of money, a lot of very wealthy Wall Street people were pouring money in to beat John McCain. Uh, the money this year is almost exclusively going to Republicans, and guys like George Soros are sitting this one out because they don't, they don't think that Obama has gone far enough for, for their taste. So this is uh, the money tr uh, thing is an important part of the game. Super PACs, uh, and, and guess what? Money has always been part of politics. Never, never has not been part of politics. Uh, and has always played a huge role, uh, and this, uh, there's a d more direct correlation between uh, billionaires now and funding campaigns, but you know, it used to be to go to the political parties, now they run their own thing. Um, on, on voter uh, registration and voter suppression and the idea of, uh, I think that Republicans believe that it's altogether uh, appropriate for people to show an ID before they uh, vote. Uh, it's altogether appropriate because you have to show an ID before you get on a plane. You have to show an ID before you uh, uh, many times go to the movie theater. Uh, and the idea that this is uh, unnecessarily suppressing the vote is, is, is ludicrous. Now, that being said, uh, as I said earlier, uh, a lot of um, one Republican in particular said the reason we want to pass these, these voter ID laws is to help us politically, which was an idiotic thing for him to say, but he said it, and so it's kind of belied the, the idea that this is all just for the, the good of uh, democracy. Um, and, you know, and part of this, you know, Republicans have always believed that the Democrats commit great voter fraud. This is, I mean, from 1960 when Mayor Daley stole the election for Jack Kennedy, uh, it, it, and, and Lyndon Johnson stole the election for, for Kennedy in, in Texas, uh, to Tammany Hall. I mean, this, is always, this has always been something that Republicans have believed. Now, you can make the case that that's all crap, that there is no such thing as, 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 as voter fraud. Um, and, and there's also the long legacy of uh, Jim Crow in the South and the idea of, of disenfranchising African Americans to be able to vote. And that is, that is the other legacy uh, that comes, comes about. And this is kind of a great debate between the parties. Um, it is what it is. Uh, and there have been efforts in key swing states to tighten up the requirements so there's less fraud, which uh, people on, on the other side think is an effort to disenfranchise voters. I would be remiss if I didn't respond. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, uh, the history is the history. And, you know, if there's been fraud, 
It's regrettable. Um, but there shouldn't be either fraud or repression from this point forward. And in terms of what's happening in Ohio, um, the Republican Party's position is um, we should allow early voting everywhere in the state except in Cleveland. Why? Because the Democrats in Cleveland. The problem is that the, both parties are subject to the critique that they're just not genuine about this. Um, we do need to make sure there's no fraud. And Democrats have to accept that. But at the same time, we need to make sure that everyone eligible to vote is allowed to vote and that their votes are not suppressed. And let's do two, two, and then we'll come back to the speakers with the answers. Thank you. I'm from Nigeria. My name is Debola Dimiji from, I work for Guardian newspaper in Lagos. I, I want to know, money is now a major issue in this po politics. What is going to be the effect on the politics in Africa, one? Then second, I want you to also tell us whether Obama did he support gay marriage based on principle, or it is political? I think they're, they're, gonna ask, they're gonna ask two questions. He's gonna ask questions. Okay, this one is specifically for Mr. Quinn. My name is George Davis, I'm from Nationwide 90 FM in Kingston, Jamaica. Given what you've articulated about the trust factor with the Republican ticket, Romney and Ryan, and uh, their flip-flopping on major issues, and uh, the fact that you just don't know where they stand on the major issues, why is it that Romney is still on Obama's coattails, especially in the key swing states? What is that factor that has kept him front and center in the race, despite uh, the negatives of both what he and Ryan represent? Um, I have answers to both. On, on, on the gay marriage question, um, most Democrats, I think, and, and uh, for that matter, most Americans, um, it's, it's interesting, it, because it's not just a liberal point of view. It's also a libertarian point of view. Um, I think most Americans, and, and polls reinforce this, um, believe that you know, people should be allowed to marry whomever they want, as long as it's a person. <laughs> <laughs> not you lizards. Know? <laughs> you know? um, so I think it's pretty broad support in this country for, um, for, for the notion that you should be able to, to marry a person of the same gender. Um, in terms of why is Romney still in this, despite the fact that he's a terrible candidate, um, the answer to that is um, the critique about where we stand and and the stewardship of this economy um, is not without merit, okay? That is to say, this economy, the US economy, is terrible. Um, we have a lot of people out of work. We have a lot of people who have lost their homes. And we have a lot of people related to all those people. This is the point I made about healthcare. At, at the point at which this economy was literally going over the cliff, we, we were having a debate here in Washington about what we called an individual mandate on health care. Madness. Madness. People out there in the country, I think, were scratching their heads and saying, gee, the lady across the street just lost her house. My next door neighbor just lost his job. And we're talking about, how I have health insurance. The president and the administration stubbornly pursuing 
health care reform. Now, is it an advantage or a disadvantage right now for the president? That remains to be seen. I think that there's a good chance the Republicans end up on the short end of this debate because people really do care about um, covering pre-existing illnesses and covering their kids who've graduated from college in the last four years and can't get a job. Okay, so it's very important to people that their kids be, be on their health insurance plan. Romney's against that. Romney's against covering pre-existing illnesses. Un, un, well, he, he, he lied to the American people the other night about his, you know, he, he's for it as long as you have a health insurance policy. It's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> let me, let me, let me That's jump not, in. Not um, the point. Uh, <laughs> all right, Jack. Um, let me ask, first point on, uh, on Africa and money. Um, you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that America is not showing uh, a very good, not being a good role model for, for other countries, especially developing countries, by having uh, their whole elections up for the biggest bidder. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So it doesn't have particularly good implications for, for what's happening um, uh, in the United States and, and Africa. Um, on the gay marriage issue, you know, um, I disagree. I, I don't think that most people are for gay marriage. I mean, I think, that, I think things are changing, uh, and it's changing very quickly. But it's changing politically quick, quicker than it is. And if you look at almost any, for example, North Carolina just voted 60-40 against gay marriage. Almost every major church, by that I mean major conservative church, Orthodox church, the Catholic church, for example, almost every black church in America, um, uh, the Mormon church um, uh, are, is still against gay marriage. Um, and um, if, you, if you go to... I think the media is very much uh, in favor of gay marriage, and I think the, Democrat, the, the Democratic base is um, uh, very much predicated on the idea of gay marriage. That's why they put it on their platform. But there's a sharp distinction between the parties, and there's a sharp, and polls show that if you go to church more than once a week, uh, or go to church once a week, you're much less likely to be in favor of gay marriage than if you never go, never go to church. And um, this is kind of the cultural divide in the United States. And that, in many ways, this is what this election is about. It's not just about the economy. It's also about the cultural divide, which is why this um, election is so close. Uh, and there's no doubt that if, the, 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 if you're younger, you're much more likely to support gay marriage. If you're older, you're much less likely to support gay marriage. And that is another cultural divide that has implications for this election. because. In 2008, all those younger voters came out and voted for Obama, and all the older voters, by and large, voted for uh, McCain. Now, the question is, do the older voters come out because they're, because they're so energized like, like they were in, with the, the hope and change, or are they so disillusioned because they can't find a job, they're still st stuck with their, at their parents' house, and they can't pay off their student loans? Um, and so that's why this election is so, so close, despite the, fact, and, and despite the fact, as Jack points out, that Mitt Romney is not a guy like us. He doesn't go out for beers. He doesn't. Uh, he's not very, not, not very natural politician. And as Jack also points out, he has all these secrets. Like, you know, where's why is his money stuck in the Cayman Islands? Anyone here from the Cayman Islands? It's a very nice place, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, I think that you have to, when you're thinking about this election and why it's so close and why the next several elections are going to be close, is because you have to continue to have this cultural divide. Uh, good morning. My name is Thuy. I come from Vietnam. Uh, I Firstly, I would like to have a question for Mr. Jack. You mentioned that um, um, when you introduced about yourself, you said that uh, for, for us, the IV from the other countries, we always think that Democrats is the one. Uh, but in your introduction, you said that you are the Clinton Democrats, not the Obama uh, Democrats. So could you clarify this? And to my second question is regarding the strategy this morning. Oh, just one. Can you rephrase the oh, okay, question? Sorry. Sorry. Can you rephrase the question, please? Um, the question is that for us, the IV, when we go to United States, we always see Democrats as one. 
But you know, in your introduction, you mentioned that you are the Clinton Democrats, not right. the Obama Democrats. So could you clarify this? And um, regarding this morning's attack to the U.S. Embassy, um, how do you think it will impact to the U.S. election? How Romney will use this to attack Obama administration? Because when I follow the CNN news this morning, um, Mitt Romney said that he blamed the U Obama administration for this attack, and of course, how it would impact to the U.S. foreign policy. Thanks. Let me let me start at the end. One more question. My name is Luis Vivanco from Quito, Ecuador. Uh, I want to know uh, for two uh, gentlemen, what do you think, uh, how was the, the job that Obama did with the international relationship between the uh, United States and Latin America, and what will be the future if Rumi wins or if Obama wins with the relationship with Cuba, Guantanamo, and Hugo Chavez? Um, okay, let me, let me The two Democratic give, parties, the embassy, and Latin America. Yeah, quick, quick responses to these things. Um, in terms of Romney being critical about the embassy bombing, I think that's a huge mistake uh, for Romney. Um, I don't think people react well. I think people get the idea that this is not something um, that any president would be culpable for. That, that you know, this is not his fault. These things happen. And to be critical of him personally on something like this rings really hollow. I think that's really unwise. I think it would have been much smarter for him to say um, actually something supportive of the president. This is a tragedy, um, something no president uh, should have to go through. And you know, my hopes and prayers are with him. That would have been smart. I think he looks like a shallow politician for criticizing Obama for this incident. Um, secondly, in, in terms of the, the, two the two Democratic parties, there are two Democratic parties. There were two Democratic parties when I worked in the White House. Okay, um, We had a left wing, and we had what I like to call the center wing. Um, and there was, the was a- The sane wing. You know, <laughs> no, it was very different. I mean. We, we had titanic struggles um, inside the White House. The mayor of Chicago was not in the same camp I was in, OK? Um, I was in a centrist camp uh, that advocated um, signing the welfare reform bill, putting 100,000 cops on the street, and balancing the federal budget. Um, uh, mayor Emanuel. Um, George Stephanopoulos on ABC. I mean, there were a host of people inside the White House. I, I distinctly remember sitting around in the cabinet room and having uh, the president go around the room with all of the cabinet officials and senior staff who were then there asking the question, should I sign this welfare reform bill? And I assure you, if it had been a matter of a vote, he would not have done so. All right? There were, very small handful of us who urged him to sign it. Um, so there are two very different parties. President Clinton, in his convention speech, you might have noticed, never mentioned gay marriage. He didn't say a word about it. He didn't talk about whom you love. Okay, That's not to say he's against it. It is to say it's not at the top of what he thinks we should be talking about to attract support in the country. So yeah, the Democratic Party is divided. There's no doubt about it. Um, having said that, what we will need going forward are candidates who can bridge um, the, the constituencies that, that might support the Democratic Party. There's a third. Uh, Latin America. See, forgive me for, for like forgetting that, because my answer is it, it's just shameful that 
every presidency in modern times. Just to say, you know, the Clintons, the Bush, I mean, President Clinton, I think, did a pretty good job with the particular focus that Mac McClarty uh, brought to it, um, to focus on the relationship with Latin America. Um, but in you know the last 12 years, we've really fallen back to an historic um, I don't want to overstate this, an historic um, forgetfulness about the importance of Latin America uh, to, to this country. Um, and that needs to be corrected. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just, I think Obama's done, a, uh, in many ways he's been lucky in, uh, with, with Castro and with uh, Chavez both having health problems, that uh, things have been um, you know, not as intensely uh, partisan as they, they were under Bush. Obviously, Latin America is a, a tremendous export opportunity, uh, uh, and uh, the business relationships between you know, the Brazilians, for example, and, 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 and uh, the Costa Ricans, and, uh, uh, and obviously our relationship with, with Mexico, uh, with a new, new administration down there. I mean, this is, this is critical to our national security. I think the most, the most complicating factor uh, of our relationship between uh, the United States and and Latin America is, um, is what we're doing with the, the war on drugs and, uh, uh, and how we help uh, um, the uh, different administrations deal with narco-terrorism. And, uh, and, and also the, the other big issue uh, is uh, dealing with immigration in a responsible fashion. I think that the president has been very, very effective at giving lip service to immigration policies, but actually he's exported more uh, Mexicans than any other uh, president in history. And, um, and so he's kind of trying to play it both ways. Uh, I also think that one of his biggest failures of his first two years um, was not passing comprehensive immigration reform when, when, he, when he said he would put that on top of his agenda. That being said, uh, the Republicans um, you know, have to get, I, the reason I talked about demographics at the beginning of my talk is because if, if this election, if the election of 2008 was a harbinger of, of things to come, uh, and Republicans don't get their uh, uh, head straight on things like immigration and dealing with a, an increased uh, Hispanic population uh, and uh, population from Latin America and the diversity of America, we just have to get smart about this. And I don't think we're there yet. Um, and I don't think we have much time before we, we, we get our act together, just given the demographics of the country. Um, you know, I, I, to, to Jack's point on, on the two Democratic parties, I don't necessarily want to get there, but there are also several Republican parties. There's the Tea Party, and then there's the Establishment Republicans. And they, uh, you know, when you're, unlike in many of your countries, uh, we, we are a two-party system. And we don't really, we have our coalitions within the government. Um, and uh, you have to, managing those coalitions within the government is in no way an easy thing. And this kind of gets to your first question about the embassy, embassy bombing. Um, the reason that Mitt Romney uh, said what he said, uh, he didn't condemn the president for what happened with the embassy. He condemned the president for their statement uh, uh, from the Egyptian embassy about uh, apologizing uh, for the, um, uh, the, the film that was being made, which I think that the Romney and the hard right found to be extremely uh, objectionable. To Jack's po political point, which is a good one, is that when, you're, when the nation's attacked, the last, thing, the, first, the last thing you want to be seen as trying to exploit that for political purposes. And I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell Mitt Romney to knock it off. Because he's got to understand that on some of these, when, when there are certain things that, are, that happen, you have to react in a non-political fashion, which he did, ironically, yesterday when it was on 9-11. And with his embassy attack, you just have to talk about how, how the brave diplomats on the front line uh, of America, we, they deserve our respect and uh, they deserve our support and in this time I'm not going to play politics. That would have been the smart thing to do, but um, instead he went for the shiny, shiny object which was, uh, you know, let's play politics with this apology for America thing. Heather, okay, I think this will be our last round of questions. I'll take this one, um, maybe one here, and Governor Blanchard if you have a final question. Federico Arce, Embassy of Nicaragua. 
My question is, what races does the Republican Party need to win in order to achieve the possible best case scenario of taking back the upper house? Uh, what Senate races should we be looking at um, where we're gonna see potentially shifts um, between the two parties? And if you could comment particularly on the Virginia race, thank you. Okay. And right over here. Hello, my name is Irina Salomko. I came from Ukraine. I'm observer of, new, of magazine correspondent. I just wondering about such thing. Was it true? Uh, it's fair statement that who get more money, who will be the winner of the president uh, election campaign? And I just uh, so with this I have uh, one more question about so why businessman now does not uh, gave money to Obama and gave its to Ronnie, as you told us. So why, what is the motivation? Thank you. Anyone here and then we'll go there. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Donat Sula. I'm coming from Republic of Kosovo. I would like to ask uh, uh, both uh, uh, of you about the foreign politics of United States uh, in next Monday, despite who will win uh, the election. Are they going to change uh, in relation with uh, Europe and especially with Balkans, or will be the same like they were till now? With the Balkans? Balkans. Yeah. Uh -huh. And last. Um, uh, I'll wait. Um, well, let me let me start with the easy let question. You wait. Okay. Let me start with the easy question. The Senate. The. For the Republicans to take the Senate, um, they've got to win a majority of the races in Montana, North Dakota, Ohio, Virginia, Nevada, Arizona. Um, those are the really, I think at this point, pretty hotly contested races. Um, if they can take most of those, they will control the Senate. Um, I actually um, have um, had some experience in the Balkans and spent some time in um, both uh, Serbia and Bosnia in the last several years, and spent some time dealing with the State Department um, on issues uh, related there. Um, I think my, my instinct is that um, it, it's hard to imagine much changing. Um, I, I myself spent a pretty long period of time being very frustrated um, that the attention of the State Department was distracted elsewhere. Um, and I don't see anything in, in the immediate future changing that. Um, it's not unlike Latin America. Look, the, you know, we, we have an expression here um, in the U.S. about 12-year-olds um, playing soccer. Um, you know, they all run to the ball, right? Um, they're not very strategic about things. Our foreign policy can be like that sometimes. Um, we, we, the attention goes to the hot spots. Um, the Balkans were a hot spot. They're not now. Latin America sometimes is. It's not at the moment. Um, and so it, it's very frustrating um, trying to get the attention um, of the United States when you're not the hot spot. The good news is you're not the hot spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just to, I agree with Jack on those, those top races. Uh, the one race that I think is the most critical uh, is uh, for Republicans uh, is the Agin uh, McCaskill race in Missouri. And I say that because that was a sure winner for the Republicans until uh, Agin said uh, some really stupid comments and that had the, most of the Republican Party turn his back on him. But ironically, he's still only about one or two points down. And Missouri is a much more conservative state than, than, than people understand. And his conservative kind of views might not uh, he's, he's still not out of it. Uh, and I would say that outside of Missouri, uh, Missouri, Missouri, which way you want to say it, uh, Virginia is so critical for a couple of reasons. First of all, 
it, it can also uh, determine the, the, uh, who controls the Senate, but also in many ways control of the White House. And you're going to see so, many, uh, so much mobilization, so much money poured in Virginia. Uh, and uh, my basic theory has been that Romney can win Virginia and still have Allen lose, but Allen can't win Virginia unless Romney wins. Uh, that's been my basic theory, although I've seen that uh, the last couple of polls, uh, Allen is actually out polling, um, uh, out polling uh, Kane um, and out polling Romney. Uh, one thing I would say about the Balkans is, uh, and I'm not don't have nearly the experience that, that Jack has, uh, but the, the foreign policy for the uh, White House is going to change uh, on, on several fronts. First of all, uh, um, you're going you're to have a much bigger neocon influence. Um, which means that they're going to be, you know, much more anti-Muslim in Kosovo. Uh, and um, the other thing is that, uh, strangely, I think, at least many people find it strangely, uh, Mitt Romney really does not like Russia. <laughs> and um, that will have a, a definite <coughs> impact in, in, in the, the Balkan regions and the relationship with the Serbians. Um, and so I don't, you know, I think that that is uh, something that's going to change. And I think that, you know, by and large, it's been status quo under the Obama administration in, in, in that region. Um, and if it, change, if it does change, it, 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 it will have an impact on, on the Balkan region. And finally, I, I didn't necessarily say that if you have the most money, you're going to win the election. But it sure doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Beats the alternative. <laughs> right. the I think this amb ambassador has a, a point or comment here. No, a very short question. Uh, there are emerging democracies in Africa, and this is election time. How is uh, each of the parties win going to impact on these emerging democracies? Which country are you from, Ambassador? I'm from South Sudan, the youngest country in the world. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, my instinct is, is to say that um, President Obama is going to be more mindful of Africa generally um, than, than would be a President Romney. Um, having said that, um, the, the largest diaspora in the world right now, you no doubt know, is Chinese in Africa. A huge influx of Chinese into, into Africa, a huge attention from China on Africa. Um, this has to do with resources, of course, and, and, but it, 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 is, it has enormous geopolitical significance. Uh, and I hope and trust that our State Department is mindful of this. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, whoever our president is um, understands the importance of, of paying much more careful attention uh, to the historic relationship with, with Africa generally and uh, the countries with which we've been allied specifically. Um, I hope that will be the case. It, it's important. Um, and, and I say that not because of any... Um, an antipathy towards China, just that it's instructive, I, I think, um, that, that a country like China is paying so much attention. Uh, yeah, I would, I would make a, 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 brief, a brief comment. Um, I would say that, um, you know, one of the greatest presidents in history, and probably one of the more popular presidents in history, uh, in dealing with Africa was George W. Bush uh, because of his, uh, really, his uh, commitment to funding a lot of anti-AIDS um, uh, treatments. And um, in many ways that, and Jack is absolutely right, that the struggle in, in Africa is, is between who has the most influence between our kind of soft, you know, diplomacy with, with uh, AIDS uh, uh, and other kind of, uh, 
uh, relief efforts, and then the Chinese who are just you know building things and 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 be having a, a huge uh, influence in their own right. And the other part of that is uh, the as you know uh, the fight uh, of Christians versus Muslims, and 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 really the extension of the of the war on terror in in so many of the uh, of, of the countries in in, in Africa. Um, and so uh, how will Romney deal with that? I mean you know. If you're a Tea Party person, you don't necessarily love George Bush for a variety of reasons, but you don't love him because he spent so much money. And where he spent a lot of money on was in, in Africa. Now, I happen to think that was exactly the right thing to do. Uh, but foreign aid, by and large, is not very popular with Republicans and not really popular with the American people, no matter what it is. Um, so for someone like Mitt Romney, he's got to understand why this legacy of George Bush continued to a certain extent by President Obama uh, has to continue with, with him because this is an important part of our, our, our mission. Uh, and, you know, uh, in the battle for resources, I mean, Africa is obviously a, a very important uh, place. Um, and so hopefully, you know, Romney will get that message. But I think he'll definitely get the message when it comes to uh, continuing the, the fight against uh, um, Muslim extremism and terrorism. Thank you. I think we should end up with hearing from the governor. I have just and one comment. One comment and a thank you. First of all, Ambassador Jack and John, you've done a fabulous job, and I think we all appreciate it. And we welcome all of our guests to thank you for being with us. And let me also say that you 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 alluded to something that I think is so true, Jack, about the State Department, the White House, the National Security Council. And that is they're gonna only deal with two or three hot spots in the world at a time, and usually they're the same ones. It's the Korean Peninsula. It's terrorism in the Middle East, what we do there, and Middle East negotiations. Back with Bill Clinton, it was also Northern Ireland. There's always two or three like that. How are we getting along with Russia? Which is why our ambassadors to all these other countries and their ambassadors to the US are so important because the State Department, the White House, doesn't have time to worry about those relations. I was up in Canada, and people said, what do you do up there? I said, well, we had NAFTA, we had open skies, we had a Quebec referendum. The ambassador to a country, or, or the ambassadors to our country, basically manage the relationship between the two countries. <laughs> and they manage the day-to-day -day relations, which underscores the importance of having good people here, and why we at Meridian love working with you. We appreciate your being here. We appreciate the members of the uh, journalistic community for covering this, but diplomacy is not dead. Ambassadors are not mere messengers. They help manage and craft and create policy and, of course, goodwill. So, Ambassador, we thank you for your service as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You are so right. Um, I'm going to tell you a story, uh, and I think it's terribly imp I served in the White House for four and a half years, and I think I'm accurate in saying that um, I was visited by two ambassadors in the whole four and a half years when I was counsel. Um, one was the uh, ambassador from Israel. The other was the ambassador from Ireland, who was a frequent visitor. Um, I have to be careful in what I say here. The State Department is where you go. They're very important. But don't be shy. Develop relationships in the White House. I'll tell you, that, that Northern Ireland peace process got kicked off because of small handful of people inside the White House um, who admittedly were part of the Irish diaspora in the United States, um, urged President Clinton to grant a visa to Jerry Adams. That started the whole process. Um, the Warren Christopher, who was the Secretary of State, was adamantly opposed, adamantly opposed. Tom Foley, who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives, was adamantly opposed. But people inside the White House urged the President to do that, to send a message to Great Britain and get the peace process moving. And it happened. So 
don't be shy. Develop relationships inside the White House and stick with them, use them. Yeah, just one more, one, I know I want to say from the congressional standpoint, uh, my boss spent a lot of time developing relationships with other speakers and other parliaments. And we spent a lot of time doing a lot of travel overseas and we entertained many delegations. Don't forget about the Congress because as Jack points out, um, there were a lot of members of Congress that were pounding on uh, the White House and pounding on uh, the uh, State Department. And they do it on a variety of things. And I, I'll give you a perfect example of that is there's no stronger friend of the people of Israel than the Congress of the United States. And they've dictated foreign policy in many ways on, on uh, Israel. And the Congress is an extraordinarily important place to do business. Thank you very much. I think we conclude with that. Thank you, Meridian and Yes, Miss. absolutely. And thank, thank you very much to these two extremely interesting thank you, uh, commentators and pundits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Been yes. a pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. Wasn't that an unbelievably fabulous program? <laughs> you journalists have already demonstrated that you ask the next question, and then the next question, and then the next question. And you look for the nuance. You look for the fact behind the fact. And for the next three weeks, that's going to be your challenge, to come up with whatever your ultimate point of view is, and to do it knowing that you've left here, having spoken to myriad different Americans with many, many different points of view, but that you have come to your own conclusion. And that is so important. We are so happy that you're here and that you're here during this incredible political period. I'm Ambassador Sharon Wilkinson, diplomatic advisor here at Meridian International Center. And this is Dr. Phyllis Kaplan, who is the president of the Hospitality and Information Service. And our two organizations co-sponsor this program. Ambassador Figueres, Mr. Quinn, Mr. Fury, Thank you so much, Ambas uh, Ambassador Governor Blanchard. Thank you so much for, for wrapping it all up for us. It was a wonderful morning. And we have some gifts for you, if you'll be so kind as to accept them. Thank you so much. I don't work for Congress, I can take them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Nice to see you. Pleasure nice to, to see you. you. Thank you. Oh, you see? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.